Welcome to Breaking the Mask of Depression with me, your host, the Diva with Depression. I hope everyone is doing well today. Uh, the The world is a shit show. I know that I say that every week, um, <laughs> but, you know, it just seems like it just keeps spiraling into a deeper shit show every single day. So I hope that you guys are protecting your mental health um, and your physical health um, while all of this is going on because... You know, we get caught up in, in especially us impasse, you know, intake everything. So please, please, please protect your peace. Today, I have an amazing guest on and I met her years ago um, and I've followed her ever since. And you guys are going to love listening to her because she's just an amazing, amazing person, a uh, woman who is part of the mental health advocacy, minority mental health. Um, advocacy community and uh, let's not waste any time let's go welcome 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 thank you so much for having me it's an honor to be here oh, I'm so glad that you decided to come I'm so glad we finally got together um, I was thinking were we taught were we on a Takeda panel together or I don't remember which one but it was years ago just a couple of years ago um, and I know that I, I, I did follow you, you know, since then. So introduce yourself. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. I'm Imade or Made. I use uh, she, her, she, they pronouns. Um, I am from North Carolina. Uh, grew up there. Uh, family originally from New Jersey. Um, and uh, my start with mental health advocacy, I was basically speeding on a Los Angeles highway, wanting to die. Um, that led me to the student counseling office at USC, uh, where I was as a grad student and two, uh, counselors, uh, one white, one black told me that I needed to get into the back of a police car and go to a psych ward. And they told me that I have to, um, leave my entire graduate program. Um, right. and in the midst of that experience, I knew that I would lose everything if I left my graduate program. I would lose my health insurance. Um, I would lose um, my opportunity to advance my career. Um, and so I had to advocate for myself in that moment and told them I'm not going in the back of a police car uh, to a psychiatric facility. I will complete my program. And I got a therapist who diagnosed me with major depressive disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was back in uh, winter of like, I think 2012. And that was the beginning of the journey for me as a mental health advocate. And I'm the founder of Depressed While Black. It's a 501c3 nonprofit that provides black affirming personal care items to psychiatric patients, uh, some like myself. Uh, so yeah. Wow. So you, you, you said a number of things that, uh, well, number one, the suicide discussion we don't have in our community. Um, number two, advocating for yourself. Um, I've done several blogs and talks about medical racism, and, and especially in the psychiatric community. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Um, so when you stood up for yourself, how did that feel? Uh, it's hard to, to yeah. someone. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really hard to advocate for yourself when your mind and your body is crumbling. And I think that far too often the mental health system, um, it forces people with the least amount of resources to advocate the most. Um, and so when I was talking with those counselors and basically refusing to leave my program and refusing to go into a back of a cop car just because I'm sad, um, I can barely keep my body up. Right. I was leaning over the chair. I was, my hair was, had locks like I had, you know, back then mm -hmm. crumpled, you know, over, lying over my face, 
Yeah. I remember holding a, a, a tissue in my hand. I could barely sit up in that chair. And I had to kind of fight these two <laughs> counselors yeah. and kind of get them off of me because they wanted to get me out of that program and they wanted to disappear me. And that's what far too many mental health professionals do. They try to disappear Black people just because we're sad, just because we have a mental health crisis. And so in the moment, it wasn't like it wasn't a feel good self-advocacy story, to be honest. Um it, it, I, my back was against the wall and I was fighting for survival. Um, but I think looking back, um, that was the start of my advocacy journey. Um, and looking back, I, I see like well, how powerful I was that these two folks in USC have a lot of power. And I was telling them, you're not going to do what, no. what you think you're going to do to me. Right. And all of my, I guess my courage um, and came from that moment of me choosing myself over the entire punitive mental health system. Right. And so I feel, you know, looking back on it, I feel so proud of myself. And I know that I paved the way for other people to say no, yeah. um, because I, I came back to that school, to USC, to do a mental health talk. And I heard from students who said, uh, I, you know, people were also forcing me to to leave campus or I had a friend or there was a story of someone who died by suicide and they dealt with some of these situations at USC. So it, I know that me like saying, no, I'm going to make sure that my voice is being heard in this moment. I know that it paved the way for students to also say the same thing. You go, girl. You go. <laughs> um, have you lived with mental illness all your life? Um, I think my mom would say that, but I wouldn't say <laughs> that. <laughs> you know, mamas be knowing. You know, yes, mamas do. <laughs> mamas be knowing. Mamas know more than me yeah. sometimes, uh, and I honor their uh, wisdom. Um, so well, I think um, my mom would probably describe me as. Uh, a child that can be really sad and really hard on herself. Um, so if I if I lost a basketball game, I could be really sad or in, in my room and not want to leave. Um, I just, I was probably my biggest critic as a child. Um, and so I dealt with that kind of like feeling that I'm not enough. I have to do more. Right. Um, and my first like introduction to mental illness, um, I was in eighth grade and I started to have a tummy ache. Uh, my head started to hurt and sometimes I would just start crying. Wow. And, um, you know, the teachers would like pull me out of class. And I remember my basketball coach was like, you know, are you going to be ready by basketball season? <laughs> like, are you good? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we didn't really know anything about mental health back then. Um, but I was referred to a primary care physician and told that I need to take this medication um, to help me kind of just like uh, relax. And the medication was like so strong that I would like black out in class. Oh and so I was like, yeah, I can't take this medication and so I just had to get off of it. And of course, you know, my mom really like, you know, did a lot of prayer. <laughs> so a lot of anointing oil was involved <laughs> in the treatment of this mental health condition. <laughs> and, um, you know, fortunately, you know, I stopped having um, these kind of tummy aches, headaches, crying spells in class. Um, but I didn't realize until decades later that that was panic attacks okay. and that I had, I was dealing with uh, anxiety issues related to being the only black person in class and feeling targeted by white teachers because I'm one of the few black students in the class and just a lot of pressure on me being a high kind of high achieving student. And I put that in, you know, quotation marks because people who are quote unquote high functioning can be deeply low functioning in other areas. Right. Um, so just want to, you know, honor the whole person. 
right. uh, and saying that, yeah, I was very high achieving student to the point where there wasn't really a lot of peers. Um, mm-hmm. I was, I felt lonely and I think I needed to talk to somebody to talk about my experiences and actually what helped me to, um, no longer have those uh, panic attacks was talking to my principal. Uh, he would talk to me before class started and he was basically my first therapist. Um, and I could talk about all my problems with him. He was just so easy to talk to. And I felt like what, what I shared was like confidential. I didn't feel like he was going to use the information against me. And so that was really my first introduction to therapy was talking to my principal for school. And that helped me to, you know, just feel like I have, I have a sense of belonging. Uh, so that was my first introduction, but things didn't get like real until uh, maybe like my mid, my mid twenties. Okay. Okay. And so what, if you don't mind sharing, is your formal diagnosis? Yeah, I had a, a major depressive disorder diagnosis um, in 2012. Um, and then I progressed into deeper into my mental health condition. And I started to recognize I don't just have uh, depression because I bounce back a little too fast. (laughs) Like sometimes when people have major depressive disorder, they have depression for two, at least two weeks at a time. It's Mm -hmm. pretty constant, um, and unrelenting. Um, but for me, I can have a really terrible depression episode. And then like two days later, I'm fine. And so I was like, something is going on because my, my, my mood is more volatile than major depressive disorder and just started, you know, doing some research. And my friend also did some research as well. And we were like, yeah, I think we have, I think in some ways it was we, because my friend was like really real close. We were trying to figure (laughs) this thing out, but also we had a codependent relationship. So it's just, that's also what happened. But, um, but yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Where you're like, this person is not my therapist, but I'm right. kind of relying too much on them. Exactly. Uh, but through our collective research, uh, we were like, yeah, I think that I have a borderline personality disorder. And uh, it took a long time to get that diagnosis. Similar to the conversations about autism and how difficult it is that, to have an autism diagnosis. Um it can be very difficult as well, not as expensive, but it could be very difficult to get a borderline personality disorder diagnosis. Um, so I had a therapist who basically told me that I'm just going to treat the symptoms like I'm not going to treat the condition and just refuse to consider that I have BPD. So I had to um, pay out of pocket uh, for a therapist who their fee was like $160 a session. And she had um, the training to give a BPD diagnosis. And so she finally provided it, but it cost a lot of money. And the only reason why I was able to afford it was because someone was giving me their money that they probably shouldn't have given me, but (laughs) (laughs) they were giving it to me now so that I need it. And so that's how I got the borderline personality disorder diagnosis. And that was around like 20, 2019. And that kind of started that journey of like getting the right treatment for my condition. So what is, because um, I know a lot of us, a lot of people, when you see BPD, of course you think bipolar disorder. Um, what is borderline personality disorder? Because that's not something that you hear in our our communities either. (laughs) Right. Like the most you may hear from Black folk is depression. Right. And maybe it may be anxiety. Maybe anxiety. Maybe. But you don't hear like borderline personality disorder. Right. And that's because Black folks who do have BPD get funneled into jails and prisons. And they get funneled into psychiatric facilities. So they don't even get the opportunity to get a diagnosis because they're dealing with mass incarceration, which is a huge, a huge deal for us. It's big for us. So, you know, I just definitely want to honor the fact that black people do have borderline personality disorder, but they're getting locked up. Right. And so, you know, and it's really it's really messed up that they're not getting the care that they deserve. But, you know, for for me, um, 
borderline personality disorder is, has a set of nine criteria. And the criteria includes a fear of abandonment and rejection. Um, it includes impulsive behavior, uh, dissociation, unstable relationships. And so because it has a set of nine criteria, it can be kind of harder to diagnose it because you may not necessarily have quote unquote impulsive behavior like, you know, they, you know, sometimes they'll say like, you know, like dangerous sex habits, uh, you know, all these different things. You may not have that. That's called quote unquote quiet BPD, right? Where the distress and the dysregulation is happening internally more than it's happening externally. So two people with BPD can have completely different experiences okay. because as you imagine, because it has a set of nine criteria, the combinations of those, it's up to maybe like, I think I've heard like around 250 ways that you can experience BPD wow. based upon the different criteria. Mm -hmm. But the major point for me is just really rapid mood swings, highly volatile mood. So, you know, one hour I'm laughing, laughing with a friend, having the time of my life. The next moment I get triggered. Maybe my, my, my partner didn't respond to my text or, you know, or maybe my boss gave me uh, feedback and it makes me feel like I'm the worst person in the world. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is, so that what those triggers, those triggers are triggering a fear of abandonment and a fear of rejection, a fear of that, you know, my partner abandoned me because they didn't respond to a text or email okay. or, you know, a, a fear that my boss rejects me because I, because, because they gave me, you know, criticism. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's a fear of loss. It's a fear of, I'm going to be abandoned by the people I love the most. To, and people with BPD, we focus on a favorite person. So this favorite person is perfect in our eyes. They don't do anything wrong. They are the, the most important person in the world to us. But the problem is, is like the moment they don't show up the way you want them to, uh, the moment they criticize you or they say something that you feel like is really hurtful, uh, they're the worst person in the world. They, you know, and then you, that's called splitting. Um, and so you pull that person off of that favorite person pedestal and then you start rapid cycling and it can be really dangerous wow. um, to, to experience. Um, so, so that's why it can be really difficult to treat. Because if, if a person comes into a therapy session and they're like, I'm doing great, I'm happy, it's awesome. And then, then maybe the next day, and I'll use a personal experience, I, I'm dealing with a lot of taxes that I owe, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And so I was great in therapy session. But the next day I see how much taxes I owe. <laughs> and then I start spiraling because I'm like, I have an unstable sense of self. That's another right. part of... of BPD's unstable sense of self. So I'm like, do I even have to be here? I mean, I, I worked so hard and now I'm losing all this money. Like, like a person with a stable sense of self is like, I have reasons to live. There are things that I look forward to in right. life. Right. Um, I am a good, you know, I don't know, friend. I am a good partner. I'm a good mother and people love me and care about me. And so I am going to live. A person with BPD, we don't necessarily have a stable sense of self. So we could just be like, yeah, like I, what? These taxes? This is ridiculous. And then we can may think of these like really self-destructive things that we're going to do because we don't have a concept that like people love us. We don't really have a strong concept of like people care about us. We don't have a strong concept of like uh, people like, you know, like us as not even just as like servants, you know, where we're like, they like us because we do things for us. Like there's people in our lives who like us because of our character, our personality, like it's just for who we are. And sometimes like, I don't even have a concept of that. And I know I must frustrate my mom and, you know, people who see me in that spiraling state. Cause they're like, you want to throw your life away Right. over this 
you know and they look at me like it's it's just taxes imare like why are you why do you want to like throw your life away over taxes it's not the taxes it's the, how the trigger makes me feel and the fear that i'm going to always feel like this because it reminds me of the meltdown i had last week and then that and it reminds me of the meltdown i had a week before and so when you have bpd or depression or anxiety you look at the past through the lens of your mental illness you don't look through the past through the lens of like i have worthwhile things to live for you look through the lens of what mental illness is telling you so if you look through the past and it's all mental illness mental illness crisis 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 and you're not seeing my friend brought me soup <laughs> like you're not seeing you're not seeing like my boss was like really like uh, accommodating and was like girl take take the rest of the week off you know like I'm not thinking through that I'm just thinking of how pain how much pain I felt yeah. and so that's kind of just how BPD can escalate really quickly and it can it could be really hard because uh we're people with BPD we're told that we're monsters um we're told that we are the crazy ex girlfriend that's literally the name of the TV show that's based on <laughs> um you know a woman who has BPD and then they covered it really well um for the most part uh Rachel Bloom is the actress who played uh the main character i really think she did a phenomenal job but that's just the label that they put on us because they're not seeing what my therapist sees people with BPD kind of have third degree burns when it comes mm-hmm. to emotional crises and emotion dysregulation wow wow <sighs> you know when just when you think that um you have it bad someone has it worse and that doesn't discount you know what i'm going through because what i'm going through is very hard too but you know listening to you and listening to others it's just people have no fucking idea <laughs> how debilitating and draining and and just life shutting down like they they have no idea the darkness that we live in none none <sighs> so When was your first hospitalization? Yeah, um it was I'm trying to think. I think it was like 2015. Um I was in New York City. Okay. Um I had a year of being on a certain medication, a popular and an antidepressant. Mm-hmm. And I was living the time of my life. I, the antidepressant that I was on um it felt like a wonder drug um i just i just felt like i could do anything i was able to be active i was in a graduate program and i was able to like hang out with my classmates uh we would have rooftop parties like just like really cool events that my 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 classmates were a part of and i felt like i could be present and be it be there with them and i had like a built-in community through that my graduate program and so i had a, a magical year and then you know the descent started happening i had to graduate and i had to i had to figure out how to find a job right. and you know i was interning in new york and i was hustling like as many folks in new york city do um i was hustling but i wasn't seeing the rewards for the hustle right. i wasn't i wasn't seeing it and I just felt really demoralized and and so like here again right like the taxes again I work so hard to save money right. you know black folks we don't have the generational wealth that, that white folks have so we have to work harder for less uh less than what white people have so I was working so hard to try to get out right. of poverty try to you know like I can't rely on my mom to take care of me I got to figure this thing out So I'm working hard to try to get out of poverty, but I still can't find a job. And I went to a a, a university where it's eighty thousand dollars a year in student loans. So I'm expecting if if you charge an eighty thousand dollars, I'm expecting a job to be that's right at the end of that. Right. And so I'm re- I'm doing internships. It's not like I'm not working at these organizations, and they're they're acting like they can't find the money to to pay me. and you know when you're a black woman 
you know, it's like you start to have questions. Right. Why are y'all telling me I'm like one of the best interns you've ever had, but you can't find the money to pay me? Pay me, yes. Yeah. You know, it's like it's not something. Is, something ain't adding up. So I I wasn't getting those opportunities, and you know, just from that frustration again, rejection, which is a trigger for folks with BPD. Um, you know, I attempted. Um, you know, the attempt was not lethal or anything mm-hmm. close to that. Um, but you know, it was deeply distressing. And so, you know, my uh, roommate, you know, took a cab, went to the hospital, local hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, the local hospital was great, um, really treated me with respect. Um, It was not a good place for people who are sexual assault survivors, I will tell you that. Because we had to sleep in a room with like 20 other people. You know, if you, no, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. No one, no. Anyone who have any type of trauma background should not be sleeping in a room with 20 other people. That's right. That's right. So it was good in the sense of like, I was supervised that we were, it, we were in a fish tank. So we slept on like a little, like a reclining chair. Um, but I don't think anybody with a trauma background needs to be sleeping in, in, in a room with 20 other people. Uh, but eventually, you know, they found a room for me and I was able to have my own room and it looked nice. And, you know, if 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 I stayed there, I would have been fine because it was right in my community. It was accessible. People could visit me. But they they brought me upstate like I was going to prison. So I went from New York City to Westchester, which isn't that far away, yeah. but on, from public transport. Yeah. yeah, when using public transportation, which everybody does in New York That's City, two hours at least or more. Far, still far. So you're already duplicating um, a, a method of mass incarceration, which is sending people upstate, away from their families, away from their communities who love them, to a place where you're surrounded people that are not your community. You're surrounded by people who are who don't love you at all. Um, who this they just get in the check. Um, and so I went to a hospital that I was told is so great. It's so great. Go to this hospital. You get better. That's what they told me in the emergency room. And I thought it it looked great on the first floor, you know, beautiful hotel lobby kind of carpet. They had a gift store. Like it looked like a resort on the first floor. But when you get to the upper floors where you go to the actual psych ward, where you will actually stay, it's terrifying. So they did a great job marketing, <laughs> like with the marketing. But when you actually go behind those locked doors, it's terrifying. It's different, yeah. Um, so, I was, yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, finish, finish. Yeah, so, um, you know, we all lived basically on a hallway. Um, there was just a long hallway. And we were in, you know, we all had, we shared rooms. Um, the rooms, you know, looked very uh, you know, clinical, you know, very hospital, yeah. uh, not warm, kind of those like cinder block walls. Yeah. So like, again, reminds you of prison. Um, you know, I had a roommate um, who was nonverbal. And so, you know, my roommate wasn't getting her needs met. I know that for sure. I wasn't getting my needs met. And because she wasn't getting her needs met, she was me. Like, I don't know how you could be nonverbal, but me. But me. Like, mean and because she's not getting her needs met they're not listening to her so of course she mean and you know we're having interpersonal conflict because she's blaming things on me (laughs) like it's just a lot going on so we're we're having roommate problems and then on top of that I'm terrified that somebody is going to um come into my room when I'm sleeping because the, the patients were being over medicated And there was a patient that was walking into people's rooms and just not knowing where he was going. So I was terrified. I couldn't sleep. The only the only the only way I was able to sleep was because um, they they just disrespected me. And so I acted up or acted out (laughs) and 
just I just was like I'm 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 at this door I ain't leaving right. like because because I came I came I came from like the we were fighting police brutality on the streets we were protesting right. so I was already like amped up like okay let's go <laughs> like yeah. because I'm already and this was before Black Lives Matter right. so just to say like black folks have been protesting police pr- brutality for a very long time because this was 2015 and we was getting active in the streets uh protesting the the murder of eric garner right um so i walked new york city streets and they had his eyes and they had a photo of his eyes and it and they blew it up so that it was the whole street his eyes took up the whole street so the grief the mourning of just the murders of black people were in my body, in my bones. And I was grieving black folks at that time. And I just, I was so disrespected there. I was just like, I'm, I'm not leaving this door. And so, because I, I didn't, I wasn't compliant, which is what they love to say, right? She's non-compliant. Um, you know, they tackled me to the ground. Um, they threatened me with drug injection and they threw me into solitary confinement or uh, isolation room. Mm-hmm. And these, and these nurses were black people. So that's another thing you got to talk about this. We got to talk about this, right? Black faces in high places. They're not going to save us, right? That is what uh, I think uh, Professor, I think Benjamin, I think, and Spellman, that was that was um, their um, kind of their graduation speech was like, black folks ain't going to save us. The, the, the people who tackled me to the ground were black, right? And they were given orders by a non-black doctor. So we have to talk about how like a lot of these psychiatric places are plantations where black folks um, are making money for these hospitals because we're filling their beds. We're making money for them, but they use black overseers to control us, our bodies. And the, and they're carrying out orders from non-black people. Um, and so we need to talk about that, right? That if we just focus on representation, uh, we can still end up being oppressed. Right. Um, so I fought as as hard as I could to get out of that in that the, the, the psychiatric institution. Mm-hmm. Um, but they assigned me a lawyer. Um, the hospitals can will will assign you a lawyer. The hospital lawyer told me she's scared to just come on my floor. <laughs> She's like, yeah, I don't even feel comfortable being here. I said, I don't feel comfortable being here either. What do you? Th- how do you think I feel? I have Can to sleep believe? here. I can't. <laughs> and the the hospital lawyer's like, there's not much I can do, right? I can't even do anything. I'm just here because you know, basically, it's legally required. So you know, we, I went in front of a state supreme court judge. They totally set me up. They forced me to wear a hospital gown. I had a clothes. They couldn't let me wear real clothes. They forced me in a hospital gown. I couldn't wear shoes. So I'm wearing the grippy sock, you know, grippy socks, grippy sock hive. Love y'all. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> So they had, had grippy socks on in the hospital gown. And they had me, they brought me in on a gurney. I'm like, I can walk. Why do I have to come here on a gurney? <laughs> but they set me up to look right. like to look, I'm to not look capable. like you're crazy, quote unquote yeah. crazy. That I'm not capable of like, you know, advocating for myself. Right. So they set me up big time. Then nothing that set me up. They had the speak first on the stand. Speak first. This psychiatrist hasn't even don't even talk to me for maybe five minutes. Psychi- psychiatrists and psych wars a lot of times they don't even talk to you for maybe five to ten minutes. Exactly. They don't even talk to you that long. Exactly. Exactly. And the psychiatrist exactly. is speaking before me. And the psychiatrist told told their, told people, and like I said, the psychiatrist, I think the psychiatrist needs more help than I do. Right. But she said that if my mom takes me home, I will jump out of the car. So she she needs to stay here because if she drives home with her mother, she may jump out of the car. Um, <laughs> I had a follow up after that. I, I always, I've, I've written about it and, and I'll probably do more shows about how traumatic 
a state and a psych ward is. It doesn't matter. It could be top of the line. You know, um, my last couple of stays was in Princeton, New Jersey. And the facility was, like you said, it was a nice facility and, you know, the food was good and, you know, whatever the case may be, but it's trauma nonetheless. I mean, it's, it's, it's suffocating. You know, I, I went, my first, um, my first visit <laughs> was in 2006 and I had never been in, in a place like this before. And, and, and I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina and, you know, um, I I was I was gobsmacked is is the word that I can think of. Like the whole time that I was there, I was just sitting there, like like I couldn't believe you know the things that were going on. And you know, why aren't people like this? Is my first time here. Why isn't somebody being more compassionate about that part? Like, why am I? This is my first time here. Why am I watching? This lady, they had to take all her clothes because she attempted to take her life and she's sleeping on a mattress in the hallway outside my room. And, you know, like, what? You know, and I was, I, 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 I <laughs> that's it. I, I was speechless, you know, speechless. And I, I, sidebar. The doctor, the my psychiatrist has been trying to get me to go inpatient for the past six months at least. And she is like like mortified and 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 so confused because she doesn't understand why I am absolutely refusing to go inpatient. And she goes, Well, what about IOP or outpatient? And I'm like, I'm no, you know, because those are the same people. It's the same people. It's the same doctors. They'll funnel. It can funnel you to inpatient. Exactly. They have no idea. Like, and it, it it's pissing me off because you know you are a doctor. You are working in in this hospital. You know, so you already know that if I do go inpatient, it's a possibility that I'll end up where you are working. So you already know the conditions there. She like it, and, and if at, like one time I'm gonna snap and say, if you fucking say it again, I'm gonna lose it because you know. Now my therapist, on the other hand, she understands. You know, my last time, one of my last times when I was in Princeton, and and when you said sexual assault survivors, um, I was in a room by myself, and but you know, with the night shift, they have different shifts or whatever. And one of the the orderlies um, took a liking to me. And so the first time that he came in my room at night, like I thought that they were just coming, you know, to look in and check to me. I had a seat back to check my seat back and stuff like that. But then like the next morning when it was time to go do your vitals and stuff like that, and he was taking them and he would just stare at me, you know, and it was so uncomfortable. And I, then the, the next, that, that night, like I closed my door. And then of course, you know, you can't close your door all the way. Um, and then when I told the nurse, finally, like I'm uncomfortable with the door open, like it, it triggers me. The P my PTSD is triggered, um, and still nothing. You know, so the whole time I was there, and this man was taking my vitals every morning. You know, and so if I'm sedated, and on a CPAP machine, you don't know what he can come in my room and do, and nobody else knows what the hell is going on, so they won't know. And and I just, you know. I, I talk about it and, and I listen, like I said, I follow you and I, I hear you and I know other people that have gone inpatient and, and had the same experience or being closed in, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm a former smoker. I admit it, but I am not a, I was never a chain smoker, you know, like two cigarettes a day or whatever, but I was smoking more just to get outside. Just to go outside, I'm smoking more. 
then I ran out of cigarettes and hyperventilated and had panic attack because I couldn't go outside. And and people don't know, like they, they think, like you said, it's a prison. It's a prison of a different kind. It's a privet prison of a different name. And and we're not being treated there. We're being medicated. And we're being, um, like you said, hidden from society. You know, we're being hidden from um, people because they think we're a danger, you know, and we're not being ministered to. We're not being, um, I, I drew stick figures, you know, like, oh, draw a picture about how you're feeling. Well, I am not fucking Van Gogh. I don't like, it. <laughs> I had a stick, Armani, I had a stick figure, you know? <laughs> like, Me too. Um, <laughs> I would do the same thing. <laughs> like, and they're like, um, art therapy. This is and, art and, therapy. And you have to go to a group. And so what are we going to a group for? Because like there are nonverbal here. There are people that don't want to talk. There are people you cannot for forcing somebody to talk is abuse. It's abuse. Forcing somebody to socialize when they're not a sociable person, that's abuse. And and these are the things that we don't talk about. And one thing about um and I'm going to get to, to what you what you're doing next. Um, but one thing that bothers me is that there are not enough advocates in the hospital, in the psych wards to help the patients and to or and the families, you know, because my my youngest had to come there uh, my last time. And that broke me, you know, because I, I don't want my babies to see that. You know, and I mean, she was older, but still. And so you need someone in the hallways. You need someone in the waiting room, you know, because when I, my first time coming in, I'm terrified. I want somebody to tell me that it's okay. I want somebody to tell me what to expect. I want somebody to tell my family that I'll be okay and what to expect while I'm in there. But we don't have that. You know, you and I are not in the lobbies, you know. Um, you have a degree, I don't, but you know, like you, because I don't have certain credentials, I can't be there to help my people, you know, and, and yes, everybody of every race, creed and color is in a psych ward, but we are treated differently. We are made to feel differently and, and that's not allowed enough. So that leads me to you to, because when I was in Princeton, and um, I had switched nat my natural hair, okay? And so when I went inpatient, you know, I had my bun, my poof. And the next morning I go, cause you know, you gotta go get your razor or you gotta go get your brush or whatever. And they hand me this wire brush and some freaking white rain hairspray. And I'm like, what, what? So I sat like, uh, so I spent the whole week, you know, doing like this, <laughs> you know, push it. Then my scrunchie broke. They didn't have an extra one. Um, you know, uh, so that was my thinking when I left. Like, where's the pink lotion? You know, where's the 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 hard brush? You know, where is the, you know, the 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 shore deodorant or you know, not everybody wants to, can use roll-on, you know, um, because you got HP and you get boils. So you need spray. Like, where is the variety? Even the goddamn magazines. Where are the black magazines? Where are the black books? I donated books. Where are they? We are treated differently. And nobody, nobody, nobody is talking about that. And that is one of the reasons why I love your organization and what you do. So please, please tell us what you do. What does the Press While Black do? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, <laughs> I created. I'm for rambling. I, you see, no, I no, it's okay. You know, I created my nonprofit for you. I mean, right. for I created it for us. Um you know, when I was in the psych ward, I, I know I noticed that black women were the ones who were overly medicated and they were in the most punitive floors. Mm 
right. um, I noticed that there was a black woman who was drooling and slurring her words, and she seemed to live permanently in the isolation room or the solitary confinement. I witnessed how her hair was unkempt because my hair was unkempt. Right. You know, and so, you know, when we when we're in these places, we're not given um, hair care supplies, skin care supplies for black uh, needs. Right. For right. black people. So um, a lot of us, uh, you know, when I went in, you know, I have fresh cornrows, you know, they fuzzy, they look a mess. Um, I, don't, I don't have the hair cover. I don't have a satin bonnet or I don't have a do-rag or, right. you know, these things. So um, I noticed my body was deteriorating and, you know, that is the worst time for your body to deteriorate right. because doctors base your discharge date based upon how you look. So right. if you can't, you know, comb your hair because they're giving you a comb for white people, you can't wash your hair because they give you shampoo for white people. You can't, you know, moisturize your skin because they gave you lotion for white people. The lotion in hospitals, basically water yeah. and a little bit of cream in it, mm -hmm. you know, is it's the most watery, useless thing you could ever have. You, you know, people are, you know, joke that you ask your after you use hospital exactly. lotion and before. Exactly. Um, so they're not giving us anything to nourish our black bodies, our black right. minds in these places, um, in a lot of these places. So, um, yeah, I just didn't want that to happen to anybody else. So I started, I started giving, um, black hair care items and skincare items, um, as well as, uh, sanitary napkins, pads, tampons, uh, because this is what I did not have. So, right. Uh, they when you when you don't have underwear, they will give you a hospital issue underwear. It feels like a spider web on your exactly. butt. It's the texture is like a mesh texture. It 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 it's a terrible sensation. I, I never liked it. I didn't understand why is it so hard to just give me regular underwear? Why well, this is dehumanizing? So I was like, yeah, we're not having that. So we're gonna donate underwear and we're gonna donate bras and boxers and things that a lot of charities. Uh, don't really think about when they donate to uh, psychiatric patients. Um, right. You know, I, like I said, I've witnessed really great work, right? It's not like, right. I, it's not like I haven't seen it. I've seen great work um, right. of organizations that donate to psychiatric patients, but I, I would look at it and be like, yeah, they got new clothes, but they're going to be sitting in three-day-old mesh underwear. Right. So it's like, they're not going to, they may not it's feel, it kind of defeats the purpose if I'm in old underwear, so I was like, no, nah, we're going to have everybody fresh from, you know, from head to toe. Everything going to be fresh. Right. So we just started donating. And, you know, I was and then, you know, by I think it was like right before the pandemic, we started donating. Uh, so in 2020 um, and um, once the pandemic hit, there was new needs. Right. Uh, patients were it had to be in their rooms all day. So they needed. Uh, activity books, um, mm -hmm. you know, things to keep them kind of like mentally engaged. Right. Um, so, you know, we you know we also gave masks as well. Um, so that was kind of like the beginning part of the pandemic. Um, I reached out to a nonprofit consultant who was like, girl, all this illegal. Like, girl, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> because I was doing this out of my, was I was doing this. Out of your yeah. Out of the goodness <laughs> of my heart. <laughs> out of the goodness of my heart. So I was giving it, using my money. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was used, I was asking donations online oh my goodness. because, you know, the, the mental health community is, is one of my, my favorite communities in the world. Right. And, right. you know, we show up for each other if no one else does. So the community was giving me donations, but yeah, my, my, my consultant was like, girl, you need to get a 501c3 before the <laughs> U.S. government shuts this down. So it was like, okay, all right, you know. I all all I care about is showing up for my people. I really don't care about uh five hundred one c three status. Don't yeah. care about none of that. I care mm -hmm. more about mutual aid. What do you need? Okay, I'll get it. But you know, in order for us to sustain the work, we had to go the legal route. So we we got five hundred one c three status. I think in maybe like July of twenty twenty. Um, and, and that we just, we just build, we just build it. So we've been donating to a hospital in Burlington for, I think almost like four years, I think wow. maybe like three. Yeah. And just hundreds and hundreds of, you know, uh, black hair care items. We started developing a black, uh, a black beauty supply kit. Mm -hmm. So it's, so it's easier for hospital staff to hand out. 
So it's a box and it has a satin bonnet. It has a wave cap, a brush that we use, (laughs) a wide (laughs) wide tooth comb, shea butter, hair oil uh, that also can double as a body oil, uh, shampoo, conditioner, uh, and lip balm. Lip balm is a really important thing because they either they don't give us lip balm or they may give us maybe like Vaseline or something. But lip balm is really important in hospital spaces because they're forcing us to talk all the time. <laughs> right. right. And, and, the, and the medication dries your, your mouth out. It dries your mouth out. Right. So lip balm is very important to have that because if your lips are chapped, you really can't concentrate on anything. Right. Um, so we give that and it's in a beautiful box. It, it looks like a birthday gift to someone. And we teamed up with Horizon. Uh, they're a black owned uh, all natural uh, beauty supply company. They they create all our products, mm-hmm. um, and so we p- partner with them. And yeah, we've just been sending them out. So far, we sent like over three hundred black beauty supply kits to hospitals uh, across the East Coast. Um, and right, yeah, and right now we we support um, Duke Children's Hospital, which is a huge uh, thing for us. I've been wanting to support Duke. For so long, like literally, I graduated from Duke as undergrad. So I'm like, mm-hmm. I have to support my people who are in psychiatric facilities at Duke Hospital. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we have an amazing staff member, hospital staff member we work with there. And I can confirm that um, from someone who we supported, who went who went into the hospital there, uh, they love those kids. Uh, right. The kids are loved. Um, and they're cared for. And so I want to just say that, yes, we are talking about psych wards and how traumatic they are, and they are traumatic. But if there is a place where, you know, I have a confirmed report that the children feel loved, the children are, are, are cared for, I want to share that as well. And so right now, what we are working on and developing is a mobile hair salon um, program where we... Um, We pay for a hairstylist, a black affirming hairstylist that helps black children care for their hair to -hmm. come in and provide hair care services to patients. So that's a a program that we're developing and building out. And we're just what we're going to do is we're going to love these kids as much as possible. Black children are being funneled into psychiatric facilities. um, And some of these black children are in foster care. So they don't have parents to check in to say, are their hair being cared for? No um, there's no advocate. So we have to do it. Yeah. And so that's that's kind of the next journey for Depressed While Black is how do we love these, our Black children in these psych, psychiatric facilities and let them know that their community loves them and we have not forgotten about them. Now, uh, the mobile salon, would it be just for children or would it be for adults also? So right now we're serving a Duke Children's Hospital. So right okay. now we're, we're starting with children. So, okay. you know, they need support because we, we bought them hair care products, but they mm-hmm. need support to know how to use them. Right. Um, so the, so we so we're, we have a, a stylist who is amazing, who like has experience supporting children on the autism spectrum, mm-hmm. children with sensory needs, children who are afraid of water. I was afraid of getting my hair wa- their hair done when right. I was a child. So she knows how to handle that. So yeah, we're starting out with children first. Okay. Um, we'll see if we get invited to do like other, like support other places. Yeah. This is actually the first time we supported children. Um, the the hospital that we supported in Burlington, North Carolina, that was an adult hospital. Okay. So I'm learning new things every day how to support mm-hmm. kids. Mm-hmm. But what I am learning is that children are not the problem; it's the adults. Yeah, yeah, because we did. They don't know how to talk to children. They don't know how to love on children. They don't have. They, it's, you know, it's a whole different set of guidelines. You know, when you're dealing with children and people don't have the patience. You know, especially in settings like that, because you have so many um, bodies. You know, and 
and like you are giving props, like I know that there are amazing doctors out there. I know that there are amazing nurses out there. Um, I, I experienced it in the Princeton Hospital, um, but they're overworked, underpaid. Um, and now after COVID, I was just telling my daughter this the other day, like people don't understand that it just wasn't citizens that lost their lives during COVID. It was nurses, it was doctors, practitioners, you know, diff and so now the system is just overcrowded. And so now we've got a system that's overcrowded. You were already neglecting us before. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now it's just even everybody's getting lost in the shuffle. So I think that's amazing. Duke is is Durham. Is Duke in Durham? Yes, Duke is okay. in Durham, North Carolina. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. That's awesome. And uh, um, do you have a desire to go to any different places? Absolutely. Um, we definitely do. We, so the goal is, is that if we can develop this program at Duke Children's Hospital and really like build it out, build the infrastructure for it, that we want to roll it out at other hospitals across the country. And okay. so, yeah, I hear that you're in Charlotte. Charlotte is a special place in my heart. I go to Charlotte very frequently. Uh, my healers are in Charlotte, so I will always be in Charlotte as long as the healers are there. Um, I have I, I have a massage therapist that's like changing my life in Charlotte. Yeah. Would love to support um, Charlotte. And I think y'all have a peer support respite center as we well. Do. We do. Um, yeah. It's fairly new, but we do. Um, but Charlotte is overcrowded and the system is overcrowded. So um, I'm the helpline coordinator for NAMI Charlotte. And so I'm getting the calls constantly, you know, well, I took my son to um, the to atrium and they sent him to Asheville. How the hell am I going to get to Asheville? You know, um, Burlington, um, Raleigh Dorm. I know one mother called me and they had sent her son to Raleigh Dorm. So she was driving, you know, had to drive back and forth and, and you know, almost lost her job. Like, um, so it's overcrowded here, you know. Um, and uh, my, my first experience was here. I don't know if it's changed any, you know, the, the experience of being inpatient here. But I know uh, that, well, that was years ago, but it, it was awful, you know. Um, so I hope that Charlotte has improved a little bit you know, but I know that there are amazing people here, you know, you, you're going to have to give me a ring when you come down next time. Um. <laughs> I come frequently to Charlotte, so I will, yeah, I do, so I will, I will absolutely hit you up yes. when Email I come. Me. I emailed you my number. Um, so. Please, yeah, I will text, I'll text <laughs> you my number back. We have okay. to connect. I, there's a coffee place I go to in Charlotte all the time, so Which yeah. One? Um, Haraz, Haraz Coffee. It's a it's a Yemeni uh, coffee okay. shop. So oh, just wow. definitely want to. And I'm a coffee so, junkie. Oh, I'm it's a junkie and it's, addict. <laughs> I think you're going to love it. I really do. It it doesn't even matter. As soon as you say coffee, <laughs> and that's it. And I say I always tell people that coffee is the the um, breakfast of mental illness. <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> <laughs> because if we don't have it forget it you know yeah, like, forget, it. forget it um this whole discussion has been amazing i yeah. you already know that you're going to come back on oh yeah because For i sure. am going to do uh a, a, an episode about just the psych ward experience yeah for sure you know so but thank you for what you do for the community and and i'm not just blowing smoke you know, like I said, I, I we're on Twitter together. <laughs> I see what you do. I see how you interact with people. I see how encouraging you are um, in spite of what you might be going through. And so thank you for thinking about others, thinking about other black and brown people, you know, and that you are doing what you can to make the experience bearable. I'm not going to say yeah. enjoyable, but yeah. bearable. Yeah. Because I'm going to keep saying it. You have people have no idea how um, 
stifling, traumatic, and debilitating mm -hmm. a state can be in the psych ward. Um, and uh, children, you know, like <sighs> babies in the, in the psych ward, I call everybody babies. Um, that's something that bothers me. So I am so excited to hear that that's something that you're going to be doing going forward. So tell us, uh, number one, where we can find D D W B, <laughs> and number two, how do we donate? How can you volunteer? You know, tell us what you need. Tell us what you need. Bag. <laughs> I know I do need a bag. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, yeah, you can go to thepresswellblack.org. Uh, you can donate there. Um, I think you know the things that we need. We need we need barbers. Okay. Um, so if any, if there's any black bar barbers in Durham, North Carolina, or okay. just in North Carolina in general, mm -hmm. um, it would be really great. Uh, so we need these, these black boys, uh, they're very particular about their hairstyles. Yes, okay. They and they don't care where they are. Yeah. They, they're in the psychiatric facility. They still want to clean, clean shape up. They still want to line up. Like they want it crispy. They want it clean. Like. The, yeah, like black children want the best. It don't matter if they in the psych ward or not. And, and we want to deliver that's the what best. They think. Mm -hmm. they think that just because we're there, we don't care about our appearance. Mm -hmm. You know, we mm -hmm. don't care about how we feel. Yeah. No, you think more about your appearance exactly. because you're stripped of so much dignity. Exactly. It's like you're trying to cling to the little bit of dignity that you have by caring about your appearance. I when I was when I was sent to a, a, a all women's floor, oh, it was a fashion show. I was like, oh, I'm about to give them some fits. I'm about to give them some looks <laughs> because we ain't got nothing else to do. Like I might as well. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so yeah, if, especially we're looking for barbers right now, particularly. Um, we're also looking for braiders. Uh, so if you know of a good braider in the in Durham area or in just North Carolina um, in general, um, we, we're also looking for that. Um, and we are also looking if anybody is good with Legos, I know that these are like random things, <laughs> but the kids, the kids love Legos. Um, and it's, it's an opportunity to really affirm them and to uplift them as like future engineers, future doctors, or just whatever they want to be like mm -hmm. future thought leaders. Legos is a really great entry point into that. Um, so anybody that wants to consider donating Legos or or if you're good at Legos, um, that is something that the kids are expressing. Um, they're also expressing the needs. They need clothes. You know, they need clothes. They need shoes. And, you know, when you're in foster care, it can be kind of embarrassing, like how much how little clothes you have, how little shoes you have, because you compare yourself to other kids. Right. And you're like. And so that that could be a cause of like insecurity, and we don't want them to live with that. Mm -hmm. um, so, if they if anybody has a connection to like maybe like a clothing company or you know anything like that, or you know that can provide like high quality clothes, the kids love screen print clothes. Uh, you know, we were told they like Nike Panda Dunks. You know, these. The kids will tell you what you what they okay. want. You don't exactly. you don't gotta guess what right. what black black children and what black people right. want. We will tell you. Right. And so they have very clear needs. They they want to you know have screen print. They want to have Nike shoes, um, things like that that can give them a sense of like like I am powerful. Like the the what I'm presenting to the world matches my identity and my personality. Right. People have the right to wear clothes and shoes that reflect their identity, that reflect who they are. They should not be wearing clothes that don't reflect who they are. And that's right. what happens in hospitals, right? They give us gowns and the texture is like hard paper. Do you know what I'm saying? Like even this, even the feel of it feels like we're not being loved. Yeah, yeah. So the, the kid, kids and, and adults are being forced to wear clothes that don't represent their identity or their culture. Mm -hmm. And so how can we allow, provide clothing and shoes that really help them like be excited and be proud of who they are as black children? Um, we also, if, if anybody, um, we need black children's books. 
as well. So we we donated already. That was one of the first things I said. Black children, okay, we are gonna get some books. They didn't even have to ask. I said, oh y'all gonna get some black books. Wow. This is not a, not even. So we have a huge batch of black books. But it, it we would love to get maybe black books that are more like YA, so like older, like maybe like thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, that kind of like that age group. Um, so that would be really helpful. Um, you know, these kids, you know, they need, they need a stable home. Um, you know, an emergency room is not a home. It's, it's not, it's not a home. I'm just, I don't care how nice you make it. It's not a home for children. Um, but we are trying to bring the love of a black home to these black children. And we'll do that through these black affirming care items that we give. And so, yeah, our goal is just, we just want to give them the love of a black home um, to them. And so we, we invite you to partner with us. Uh, Me? Go ahead. Yeah. (laughs) And all of us Um, and all the (laughs) listeners as well. to partner with us so we can bring this, deliver this black home for our children. Are you going to still do the care kits for adults or are you just going to segue into the children? So, yeah, that's a great question. Um, right now uh, we got a large grant and I love it. And I'm that's so grateful. Awesome. It's our first, it's our first large grant. Um, and, you know, depressed with black is run like, a really, really shoddy mom and pop. I'm just going to be real. <laughs> like, it's, it's just, I, I, I have mental illness. I have a day job in this nonprofit. It's something going to have to drop. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. And it ain't going to be me. I can't drop myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> I ain't dropping myself. So um, I have to, I have to improve the, the infrastructure of Depressed While Black because we got this large grant. Um, so what basically my work and my strategy is I'm going to work with my consultant. I'm going to work with my accountant to figure out a budget on how we can build this mobile salon program. And then also like, let's kind of refresh and re up the black beauty supply kits and starts sending them out to more places. So if anybody is like, Hey, um, I support a loved one who has been in this hospital and they need these black beauty supply kits. Please send requests um, to me. I would love sending them out because every time that we send out a black beauty supply kit, we are supporting black patients. We are supporting black business because a black business created the kit. And then also what we're doing is we're communicating to these hospitals we're watching you. The, we're here. We're here. Yes. We're, here. we're here. You can't treat these folks like nobody loved them exactly. because they are loved. They are. And so it's 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 a powerful tool and a of of it's a powerful humanizing tool. And, and now the it's radical. We ship everywhere. Yeah, we ship I'm them sorry. everywhere. Yeah, we do. We ship them everywhere. We ship okay. them. I think as far as like. New York. We ship them to New York um, before. Um, I would love to eventually get on the West Coast um, because I had serious mental health problems when I lived out there. Um, and for folks who are who live on the East Coast who um, move to the West Coast, sometimes we get like end of earth syndrome where we are just so isolated from our family on the East Coast. I told you my baby is there now and I'm like, I said, you know, you're halfway around the world. I just can't get to you when I want to. <laughs> but it is. It, it, uh, I, the other day, this is a totally off course, but the other day I, I was talking to her and I was like, well, um, what have you gone through, you know, that's making you feel this way? And she's like, hello, I moved to L.A. by myself. I don't have anyone here. I get it. I get it. Yeah. So please, if there's anything that I can do to support folks, black folks out there on the West Coast, I would love to do it. Um, so I know Beam is amazing. Beam, woo, when, like oh, yeah. thought leadership. 
Yeah, yeah I have just them on my website. Yeah. The services that they provide, the peer support services, um, just like oh it's just amazing so you know beam is on the west coast so i also wanted to say i defer to beam um, because they've been there way longer than i have but um i definitely would love to support black folks on the west coast um with mental health mental health like black affirming mental health um uh support and, and services when it comes to like folks in psychiatric facilities well this is what we're going to do you're going to send me a list of things that you're looking for, um, both, you know, supplies and goods and volunteers, um, because I'm sure that there are people out there that are willing to volunteer, you know, admin help or, you, you know, shipping out the kits. And like you said, you're one person and I don't have a 501c3. And I know that running this platform, it, it, it's a lot especially when we're struggling, like we're literally in the dark 24 hours a day. So you send me a list. I'm serious. You send me a list of the supplies that you need, the the volunteer work that you need. And, and I will put it on my website. I will. And, and let people know. I know, uh, I know beauty um, stylists. I know stylists. I know barbers. And so I I will put the word out. You just let me know what you need. And thank you. I, I love I love the cause. I love it. And any way that I can help you, and, and that's um that, that that's not just today. You know, if you need something, you you reach out. Don't be afraid to reach out and let me know. You know, if I can help you do something, even if it's you know an admin, you know, thing for one day, you know, I do it for everybody else, you know, um, I'm, NAMI has me going here, there, everywhere. So please let me know. Let me know. I want to thank you for coming on today. And, you know, you are such a sweetheart. And I'm so glad that I got to talk to you. And I am very serious. Coffee when you get here. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a date. Like it's, it's already in my calendar. So I always end with this. What is one thing that you want the community to know? Piece of advice, how to a piece living with mental illness. What is something that you want people to know? Um, that's a great question. I don't know. I mean, I think um, that black people are inherently deserving of care. Black people don't have to earn the right to receive uh, life-affirming care. Um, just by our existence, we should be loved. Right. And I think that is something, the biggest thing, because a lot of psych wards, they throw Black folks in the most punitive floor, and they tell us, you have to earn the right to be in a less punitive right. floor. And I'm like, no, I think Black people deserve the right to like be in a non-carceral setting from the very beginning. Right. And so I just hope that I just want to leave that, that black people are inherently deserving of care. Well, thank you, Amade. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. guys, of course, we went a little bit longer, but you know me, once I start running my mouth, that's it. I thank you guys for listening. I'm putting all of Imade's and Depressed While Black information will be on my website. I actually, I already think I have you on my resource page. But I'm going to put all of the information that you send me on my page. So, guys, if you want to donate, if you want to volunteer, if you have information about books, barbers, braiders, you know, reach out. This is an amazing cause. And we want to do what we can to help Imade and Depressed While Black keep going. And thank you for supporting me. Thank you for listening. Please share this episode with someone because, as you heard us both discuss, it's needed. You know, the voice is needed. The care is needed. The support is needed. So please share with someone because you never know what, what someone is going through. Thank you to Illumination Technology, of course, for keeping me on track. And guys, please, 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 especially during these uh, tough times that we're going through right now, please find your peace and stay well. Bye. So